She is author of 14 collections of poems and four books of fiction. Recent publications include tr uh, translations of the lilies back into the lists in garments worn by lindens, a novel, periodic companions, and a book of short fiction, The Book of Moments. She co-edited the anthology, I'll Draw My Book, Conceptual Writing by Women, and edited the anthology, A Forest on Many Stems, Essays on the Poets Novel. Honors and awards include the Pooh Fellowship, the National Poetry Series Award for her collection, The Scented Fox, and the Contemporary Poetry Series Award for her collection, Drawing of a Swan Before Memory. She teaches at the University of Pennsylvania and at Swarthmore College. Lynn Potts has three published books of poetry, two by National Poetry Review Press and one by Glass Lion Press, and more than 200 of her poems have appeared in journals including the Paris Review, North American Review, the Southern Review, Yale Review, New American Writing, Denver Quarterly, American Writing and Commentary, Georgia Review, Cincinnati Review, Oxford Magazine, New Millennium Writing, American Poetry Review, Southern Humanities Review, California Quarterly, Meridian, Crazy Horse, and others. Her poem, The Relentless, the Relentless Pronoun, was published on Poetry Daily. Lynn's work won numerous prizes, scholarships at three arts colonies, and a fellowship from the Massachusetts Cultural Council. She lives in Boston and New York. Hello. Happy to be here tonight. Um, and thank you so much to James and everybody here for coming out and this beautiful bookstore. And also to Wave Books for this new beautiful book, uh, Translation of the Lilies, Back into Lists. And I want to dedicate this reading to my son, Benjamin, who's here tonight. So in just a um, really brief introduction to this book, I started out with the idea of translating my daily to-do lists. Um, I made a lot of lists, which can be very helpful and practical, but it also started to become annoying, all these lists. So I thought, well, if I write a poem, for every to-do list I have, then I'll have a poem for every day. So I started this project in December of 2015, and it goes through May of 2016. And every poem is titled with a date and is a numbered list. Um, and the title is inspired by C.D. Wright. Um, I, wrote, I started writing this book for her, and she, she tragically passed when I'd been writing for about a month, so I hadn't given it to her. It's one in a series of books I'm writing for individual poets, um, homage texts for female poets who've been really important to me. And I think that's everything that I need to say, um, except that I'm going to start in December and just skip through reading poems till we get to the spring, skipping a lot in between. Can everybody hear me all right? So starting with New Year's Eve. December 31st, 2015, two. The daily takes too much time. Therefore, I propose to waking every second, beginning each moment. The new year is just an excuse for counting. Numbers don't keep anyone safe. Ideas lurk in symbols, and murders occur in figures. The squirrel runs up a tree, but we do not accuse him of squirrelishness, or thievery, or absent-mindedness. Where is substance buried? Shall I reply again to your drawings? I'm leaving habit on a high shelf, going for a walk in sound. January 14th, 2016, 2. In considering the form of the list, doing is surrounded by thought. 
Well, I began with the notion of translating to-do lists into oblique commentary. I now see dissolved momentary movements. Tasks which destroy one's substance may be those requiring magnification. Scale means nothing in this respect. A few words placed carefully into a shell, or respectfully on a shelf, or deliberately inserted into blankness can be more costly than a great volume, the entire contents of a bookshelf, or an enormous edifice of tears. Your voluminous collection is currently being housed in a small bird flying without direction. And if the bird should fail, these images are designed to continue as you close your eyes or begin plummeting. What is peril to a bird? First, recline in ink and paper, a series of concentric ribbons, revelation. Quilt a sector of arms, collaborative daughters. Walk through frozen woods, basilisk on arm, red hoof. The only harm you'll encounter is an imaginary enclosure which prevents the foretold meeting. Rapturously step out of the cavity of this breathing animal. February 3rd, 2016. Furiously forget yourself. Then complete the online forms. Confirm. Gingerbread meeting. Talismans. And to row with Emily Dickinson. Bring baskets, string, aprons, and books. Explain how her bodiless white dress suspended in glass is a perfect fit. How notes are poems and also tasks. At some point, his solitary intensity turned to daggers and sloth. I walked up the paper with a neighbor discussing the need to get away. He'll say we must be paid, but I prefer to endlessly stall. How different she looks when certain words emit their glow. She wore them around her neck, bound them to her thoughts, rested her face in a nest. It's all right to begin what seems distant. In fact, interrupt yourself now. My goal is to keep switching back and forth between doing and being until I disintegrate. The correct music never discusses your mood. Instead, it elevates or deflates. Form continues to morph. At first, I translated abbreviations into commentaries, opening an accordion-like discourse, but then, what was already there between the pleats began demanding a say. Finally, I've noticed by the time I arrive, parenthetical graveyards have been inserted, secret obsessions slain. Hours begin instantaneously without allowing protest or assent. It's like trying to board a bus or train at full speed. <coughs> Instead, you wait, enter when doors open before you regardless of where you may be taken. If there were once signs, maps, or signals, they have since been erased. Don't stop now. That first morning jolt of doing this is like a triple espresso. If I just sit myself down before it all begins, before dressing, before fully waking, start with dreams. He's saying goodbye through a door, and I only half hear. Could it look all right with thoughts coiled and pinned? Maybe the right pins, but these slide so nicely. Should I stop imagining the exile of pleasure? I've developed a taste for even stronger green shots of revulsion. It's like a deal I make with myself over and over. Being invincible isn't just for mothers, but no one else knows this. Actually, the message has been sent multiple times. Should I really believe she meant to sculpt my reservations into binding backdrops? I was just standing there, minding my curtains. Too many messages, not enough mind garlands. 
I miss you more than you've ever repeated those words. The other night I began stating superlatives and you happily repeated every one. You may not remember you, me, or anyone, but I will remember us, we, and them for us all. You may not recall the meanings of words, but the tones of your voice still transmit voluminous inclinations. I wish everyone could believe the dying are still living. You are still alive. March 8th, 2016. I admired the sod-filled days. How is your delicate monster, by the way? I want to go back to my pre-screen life, keeping tasks in mind, not open the windows. If I mail myself in pieces, will you assemble me when I arrive? Please send soft syllables to counteract harsh edges the myriad of mind-dissolving missives. Can you save me from those simple requests which extract all initiative? Cross out the all caps directives, costs we cannot possibly meet. Illegible stories, disallow sleep, beyond the sleep of determination. The functionality of rest has been put to bed. A crowd of displacement carries us. A few words slipped into your hand disappear. Teach me how to prevent words from entering the bloodstream directly through skin. Your descriptions are at risk when love poems become elegies. I had to partition myself from news. Everything was canceled and I was overjoyed. Don't regret the poorly written line. Translate, I had to stay away from your words. How to thin the masses of messages without being depleted, like walking through a sea of hostile bodies. I wrote to the city as a visitor. You can't help but admiring his slovenly ways. Everything was a disappointment except my ability to help others. My plans were only thoughts. My thoughts were infestations. My itinerary turned to dust. I smiled at the empty sun. My face was pale, but you would not mistake me for bloodless. I'm not the only one glad to be alive. Even six neurons, this little worm, pacify her with documents, modify her with anti-birds. March 9th, 2016. Bonnie Prince Billy sings, I will be born. Is he talking about himself? Is there a difference between being one person or another? Waking without remembering dreams is like waking without hands. How to complete any simple action. I cleared my desk of the prints of former cups. Should I have read those markings before wiping them away, first with damp rag, rag, then with dry cloth? I've strayed from divination because I'm not willing to know. When you first recorded what you needed to hear, you lived in a single cell. Later, you learned to divide. Not yourself, but those multiple beings beside you came to life, meaning to say, you decided to see them. And what if you only think you have no hands? Yesterday, I asked a fox to appear. This morning, a mottled fox dutifully trotted through breakfast, red and gray, deliberate and languid, delicate and revenant. Maybe you only think you don't see foxes or ask for visitation in place of divination. This morning, I asked, where are you? 
Are you still near the other side of cognition? Does deciding to ask for visitations draw you closer? Or is that only the fox? Nothing is only. Only is furred. I thought I woke with nothing, but I woke with you beside me. I thought I woke, but you were still a promise to remember. If there is nothing to fear, why is nothing running? Why does quiet surround me? Quietness is one of the avenues. Nothing is one bright resource. The torch trailing behind you, a deliberate beacon. March 15th, 2016. Days when everything must be done later. That school of not now. When the date alarms you, interchange numbers. March 75th, 6021. A fine year to misunderstand. When frightened about elections, I try to recall many things eventually sink. Translations for the reading that never happened? You recommend a book whose main character invites me to dinner. I would have had no idea my host was a fiction. Asked to rewrite the inappropriate lyric, then to sing it on stage? You fall asleep in all the wrong places. Irises and hyacinths are uncertain when to raise their heads. Every storm performs the work of adamant sculptors. The ground is adorned with mottled limbs, tulip tree, libations. I print out the list of recurring associations, wondering what I've missed. Read about the exile of phenomenal units of sound. Write letters of invitation to words I cannot pronounce. She wrote, I have doubts about my ability to coordinate eventuality. Euphoria war a minuscule green coterie, a countenance drenched. These next few items can only be referred to as Sisyphus, motion sickness, and the land of one's ancestors. If only naming fecundity could endow me with cover, coven, March 25th, 2016. What to wear with ruffled sky? A blue Parisian pale silk song. That's fine work finding new ice cream, wasting time in the written city, busily sewing an eye, replacing a zipper, almost missed the importance of a woman with a needle, a visitation. But can this really be mended? How surprised we were thinking only one past must be exchanged for a future. We sat in silent stitchery, every moment at first impatient. Later I saw urgency sewn together, and then pleasure along scars, whole and entire. March 26, 2016. Now that I am home, who will extinguish marrow? One, with a, one rhythm was broken, another stranded, a third waited, a chain around my neck. Becoming someone older than fiction, nice trick, or mess, or wreck. I asked myself to meet me, but I was very aloof or not at home to the idea of knowing how. Little suffragettes were washing windows, but the other side of the glass looked out onto nothing, a problem of framing, sorry to waste good soap and rags, even sadder when human efforts fail. How to ignore druthers while also throwing away spare idiocy. How to walk toward new foundations, hillsides made of light, skin erupted in crimson sanctions, addiction to repetitions. It's nice to be in bed with an open book, or to be an open book, 
transposed into a window. The book illuminates the room. I read you between coverings. You only exaggerate when you close your eyes. April 8, 2016. The light blew through my words, but the shadow of my hand remained. Fine to be a chronicler of social ills, but can you live on that? I got myself up, exercised, fed, cleaned, and set, and then I went to harvest something to counteract drudgery, cynicism, and even fate. I write against the hopeless moment, the one when we realize how little difference our efforts make. I wrote against your body, my favorite pressure. I write because you wrote, and in your words, we all had words. Inside the word inside is shelter. Come inside. And this is the last one. April 15th, 2016. Would it be presumptuous if I were to give her a name? I don't hesitate to affectionately place titles at the top of every stage we go through. Countless scenes in which I am your granddaughter. Today, you would have been 104. And this other absence, I'll call her Violet, triumphant and numerous, smiling up at me from the lawn, startlingly awake. Impossible to write the word impossible. Instead, I will write how to love our broken paucity. My idea of perfect beforehands isn't even worth rewrapping. Still, I bother to transpose myself. It's part of your private profile to see my faithful sidereal transmissions pre-arranged by passing stars. Can you see a lily planting constellations? Her hand looks exactly like mine. What do I do to be that person? Forward flight, forward flight, forward, a careful, solitary friction. Call me when you love it. Leaves, I like your thinking. To write through an entire life, nothing being always fantastic. Having read the alphabet once, twice, mess with it, off with my head, clear my desk, dis-ease become other, afraid of prying lists, what have I done? The number of numbers kept us wet and cold, subsisting on syntactical nimbus. You wanted her ring, and I was happy for you to have it. I'm so glad she left me her hands. Thank you. been in the last row and couldn't hear. So I'm wondering if I could ask you to raise your hand if you can't hear me, because I know it's very frustrating to be in it. <laughs> can you hear me now, Bob? I'll speak up. It, it, I'll please speak do. up. Because it's tough it with all the books. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for telling me. And thanks, James, for having me and all of you for coming. It's great to see you. Some of you came as far as the North Shore and as close as Boston, but it's great to see you all. And thanks for coming. And it's great to read with you, Lainey. So um, I'm going to read from a new collection, um, which is in publishing limbo. <laughs> it's called um, A Pocket Full of Rye. And it's, um, it's actually a number of various collections that I've written, but uh, there are some envelope poems that begin it and end it. And that's the way I'm going to do the reading. I'm going to begin with two poems that are part of the sort of general collection, and then um, end with one. And in between, I'm going to read from some series that 
became obsessions. So the first poem I'm going to read is called Nice and Schist. I'm a fan of Nice and Schist, both formed under pressure to make, la to make layers, which happens with personalities too. But I prefer Schist because you can pry the layers apart, spread them on the picnic table, and see them glisten. In college geology, my favorite subject was rocks, and I liked the idea of digs. Imagine how Herbert Win Winlock felt when he dug through the wall in a mountain cave outside of Thebes to find hundreds of tiny clay figures depicting Egyptians in everyday life. Rigging ships, thrashing wheat, feeding cattle, rolling papyrus into scrolls to be written on by scribes. Part of me wants to do digs in some faraway country. But part of me wants to do what I'm doing right now, sitting in a backyard lawn chair watching the sun make shadows of clothespins look like miniature tree swallows about to make a move, but not quite. <laughs> <laughs> and the sec second one is called Watermelon Love Letter. Sky over 79th turns wi window glass to watermelon pink. Once in Greenwich Village, I didn't buy a watercolor of a lemon, which I regretted. Now, decades later, that watermelon lingers, the longing with it. When Sam was little, he asked me why Peter Pan needed Wendy to sew on his shadow. It's about clinging, I said, using static on sweaters in cold weather as examples excess of electrons stuck to surfaces, body between. My regret had settled deep, which is why I tried to do a watermelon watercolor this morning. But it wasn't the same. Attachments impossible to slough off. Then I thought of the time when I was alone and scorched my upper thigh with steaming tea. Severe burns when you took me to the ER, though you'd left me years before, waited in the car for hours while doctors removed the dead skin and treated the raw. So the next few poems, you know, I'd love a little bit of water, Mike. Could you pour me something? <coughs> Thanks. Oh, she wants to write her stuff. Yeah, I got it. Nice to meet you. I have a fragile throat. <laughs> Thank you. So the the poem is um, wedged in the middle of this pocket full of rye are from series. Uh, a, a couple of series that I've written. And I often write in series, and I never know how many poems there will be um, that I write. But in this series, I knew there would be 19, because <clears throat> there's one for every month and one for every day of the week. So it made 19. And I'm just hoping you'll be able to kind of um, resonate with some of these months. Um, I'm not sure because they're very personal. February. Black branches catch the grade school roof. Doilies on kindergarten windows faded pink. You've seen glass splinter around a bullet hole. An ice slide break an awning clean in half. Well, that's how Febru February reacts even with red hearts of chocolate. Some people buy muffs at the Goodwill. Some put their stuff in plastic bags and leave. 
February's an aluminum thermos of hot toddies you left under the movie theater seat. Mm -hmm. It's when acorn squash <clears throat> grows velvet green mold in the cellar, whose pine doors is pine door is rotting at the bottom. I walked out one morning, snow gloating over a flat bicycle tire. You couldn't tell if the tire suffered or just wanted to be flat forever. <laughs> June. Happy face of emojis, lassitude and wisp. Pinkies in Walgreens fingernail polished windows. Preening azaleas in glossy chintz with low necklines. Some say lightweight, some say daiquiri, some say merry. Month of ceremony, moth-bitten uncles, bewildering silver gifts. You stood dumbfounded, worrying the decades ahead, maybe once a waterbed. Go back to your cot in the basement and beer. June is not real life. June is a white tablecloth when someone just spilled wine. Quick, get the vinegar. Can you hear me back there? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so strange to need water, but I do. September. Don't lose your head in color. Burn sienna fuchsia, chartreuse, you've been here before. Shoes, pencil box. <clears throat> you decorated your loose leaf cover with hearts and haircuts, locker door with an inside mirror to check your bags. It comes back, smell of notebooks, fresh paint in bathrooms, wondering in third grade, who do I love, David Campbell or Donald Cunningham? <laughs> Love so supple and uncertain, every year looking for a new perfection. Once in, grade, once in the grade above, once two grades lower and short. The problem is, <clears throat> love wanders the halls after everyone's gone. Only maybe, maybe he will call later. Then suddenly it's having babies. In our Berkeley days, we played shoot the moon a lot. I found I usually shot too eagerly and too soon. It's a hearts game, in case you didn't know. I find love floats the air, <clears throat> then suddenly lands on the unexpected. Once a perfect daffodil, once a dog with a grin. Usually guard, who I once married, <coughs> married and still do. I love September, but in a way, I can't stand it. It's a lunchbox that might have chips and a brownie, more often peanut butter on crackers and an apple. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the months, and I'm just going to read the one of the days of the week. It's the shortest, but it's maybe the most accurate. Thursday. Subdued in a wedding dress of maudlin satin. Wisteria in the eyes iris, it's all somber. Prick a small hole in an inner tube and listen. You will hear Thursday as a slow hiss. <laughs> and <clears throat> this next series I call, <coughs> sorry about that, I call the Cosmos poems. Um, they are all about the cosmos, but you'll find, you'll probably find some other things in them. Two trains riding alongside each other at exactly the same speed aren't actually moving according to relativity theory. You can't tell the speed or the distance because they don't exist until you suddenly see on the other train an old lover who is wearing the very same flannel shirt you gave him 10 years ago, <laughs> except for a hole in the elbow, when you wish your train wouldn't accelerate. Because if you could keep the trains in sync, 
time would have would not have passed and you'd be back in the backyard listening to Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. Something on the grill making a kissing sound. Though you'd wonder how the shirt got that elbow hole and where it went last Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> Our universe has about a hundred billion galaxies, though it's really impossible to count. Even if you did an all-nighter, which you can't do it anymore. Our own galaxy is the Milky Way, and it looks like what your baby spilled, then smeared all over the kitchen table when the neighbor called at the front door complaining about the clippers lost in the hedges the ones he says are his, but then you get distracted with the word hedge, so you make yourself go out and get them. And when you get back to the kitchen, the Milky Way is on the table in front of your baby. I have a lot of poems about frogs, and I think it's because I have a frog in my throat. <laughs> <laughs> they say light is a bundle of energy that has no mass and no electrical charge, which would seem to make it nothing. But it has to be something because we have a word for it. It's hard to say what electricity is, too. But when I was in Sierra Leone one evening, sitting on a wooden bench under a kerosene lamp, eating an egg sandwich hooked on a charcoal grill and flattened with a hand iron, everyone knew it existed. Even the barefoot children carrying plastic buckets of water in the dusty twilight. They didn't have electricity, but they'd heard the word and their mothers wanted it. <laughs> they should look in this camera sometime. Because there are people in there to the right chains. <laughs> That's true, yeah. It thanks all of you for tuning in. It takes a spectroscope. It takes a spectroscope, but you could determine the composition of stars, which are largely hydrogen and helium. But a white dwarf is an exhausted star that loses energy unless it comes into contact with another star and pulls off that star's hydrogen, making a kind of explosion which is when it's good to have a spectroscope on your back porch. Not every explosion has all the colors, but some of the blues include cerulean, viridian, persian, hyacinth, delphinium, periwinkle, and forget-me-not. Periwinkle being a cute little flirt but forget me not, like someone sad, like someone has just left you. So these are the, um, this is the last poem I have. It's called A Sense of em Empty, and it sort of ends the pocket for a ride. <clears throat> I still have that fog. A sense of empty. Imagine stuffing a planet in your pocket. What would you find about time? Or the time you didn't have a pocket? Also, the vast empty of what we can't keep in mind. Like this morning's snow, as if it could reflect a sense of space lost time or anything except what's cobbled from what happens in fraught moments. Like the time you stole cereal from the Benson General Store for Emmy, which is also a kind of empty, 
but not what gets described with equations as space dimensions. I read a book once that said human history could be told as a sequence of invented drinks, beer, wine, whiskey, tea, coffee, and coke. Coke being the greatest deviation from nature. But you can't tell where to draw the line between nature and what's made up. Like the quark nobody's seen with a naked eye, or how theft could make sense. Beer was discovered when barley was left in a vat catching water. Somebody tasting, somebody, whoops, somebody tasting it with the empty pocket feeling like a mother in a row of Benson General Store. Who can put it all together? The sympath sympathetic, the synthetic, the analytic, and the peculiar tasting it with empty pocket feeling. Oh, sorry, <coughs> I'm gonna have to back up. Who can put it all together? The sympathetic, the synthetic, the analytic, and the peculiar way things evolve in time and space. The links between drinks as beer to Coke. You probably read books too, and like me, doubt a single morality exists. You know space does, but you're not sure where in the end. It empties, which is what you feel when you're off on a winter snow by yourself. And you think you know snow, common as your coat pocket. Then it melts, and you realize you're not sure you know anything at all. <laughs> just beginning to write poems. We can often go over here just so people on Zoom can see. Should we both go? Uh, you go ahead. Go both of us. Go both of us. Go both of us. You want to go first? Well, I'll take a chance. <laughs> I'd say read, 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 read. Mostly read everything and have wine on Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> I would just add, besides reading, just write. Yep. And then just find one friend to share your work with, or more. But yeah. I think those are the key things, right? Reading, writing, and company. Yep. <laughs> and drinking. <laughs> <laughs> It's fine if you don't have any questions. Yeah, yeah. No one else has one. I have one more, which is what's on your bookshelf uh, mm -hmm. these days? What are you reading? You start. Um, well, right now, I'm really excited to read Sheila Hetty's new novel, and I've been waiting for the end of the semester. Um, something else, too. That's, that's the one. Um, Oh, the new novel by, and I'll probably mispronounce her name. Um, I mispronounce the name, but it's Nieko Kawakami. Does anyone know how to pronounce her name better than me? Um, she has a new novel out called All the Lovers in the Night, which I just brought with me on the train. So I'm excited. I, I lo absolutely love her work. What about you? Well, <clears throat> I'm so glad you asked, <laughs> because I get to tell you that I'm reading, I've just finished a history of um, the Czech Republic, because I'm going on Sunday, in spite of COVID, and, um, and I'm taking in my suitcase a history of um, Hungary, 
Did I say Czech, Czech yeah. Republic? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm taking a history of Hungary because we're hoping to take a train to look at this. We'll see. Uh, so we have one last question in the chat. Mary Bushinger asks, I'm curious to hear from Lynn about her process of writing series of poems. Oh, well, I'm glad to talk about that, and I'm glad someone asked, because I don't know how this happens to me, but I really honestly get hooked on an idea. Sometimes it's a word, sometimes it's an idea like the cosmos. I mean, I was reading a book about space and, and relativity at the time. I didn't quite understand, but I was reading it and I was consumed with thinking about those issues. And it was really fun to start riffing on those, those um, ideas in the book and kind of making them into my own stuff. So and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, January, February, that's a piece of cake. <laughs> and um, and that's, that's actually happened with me all the time. In my books, the, the ones before A Pocket Full of Rye were always about one, a riff on one thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I don't know, I just find it handy, it's easy. Because mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard to think of what you want to write about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then we have one last one, also from Mary Bushinger for Lainey. I'd like to hear more about her writing for diary entries that become poems. Diary entries. Well, this book, um, it wasn't diary entries. It was actually to-do lists. And so what I did was I translated each line of the to-do list. So I didn't include the item on my list, but what I wrote was kind of my thoughts around the item. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. we all have thoughts around things we have to do. <laughs> so um, I don't keep a diary in a conventional sense, but I tend to be always scribbling in one way or another, um, by hand, on the phone, on the computer. Like I try to just have multiple spaces yeah. where things are going. The other thing about that book I didn't mention is that there's collage. Um, I do a lot of collage, and several of the collages are in the book. They're color collages, but they're black and white. But I do have some color postcards. If anyone is interested, come and say hi, and I can give you a postcard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.